God is a God of victories. Uh, kids, you guys can't hear me? Coming through? Coming through? Yes, no? Yeah. Turned up a little. Good, yeah. yeah. Turn, turn up the gain a little bit. There you go. All right, fifth grade and under, you guys can go back. Have fun. Don't make a mess. You're going to be painting that thing. <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been an interesting uh, weekend for, for, for Rachel and I. We got to go to uh, uh, Cedar Rapids, um, where her parents are at. There was a, we had a birthday party for one of her uh, nieces. Um, Lots of fun. Uh, yesterday was a good day for water, uh, so there's a lot of water balloons being thrown about and the breaking of water balloons over little kids' heads. I like being tall. That's something that I like. Because no one can reach my head. It's a lot of fun that way. Um, the, the idea of, of family uh, getting together is so, so awesome for Rachel and I. Um, you know, we're not we're not from here. We're from, I'm from Des Moines. That's where my family's at. She's from Cedar Rapids. That's where her family's at. So when we get the opportunity to go, we love to go and spend time. Um, and it's a very uh, nice, refreshing uh, time for us. So I uh, appreciate you guys uh, letting us do that kind of time. And, and we're glad to be back here uh, worshiping with our church family. Uh, there's just there's nothing better to be in the house of the Lord, the people that you love to worship with and love with you, that God's work right alongside uh, as well. So that's where I'm at this morning on, on that. Uh, it's been good. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and I know it's been kind of sporadic with a couple of different things. We had a missionary day a couple weeks ago. We had our VBS program last week. So we're getting down towards the end. We're on, we're on faithfulness today. We've got gentleness next week. And then self-control, the last one. And then I'm still thinking I'm going to just skip right over that one because I don't want to even study for self-control. It's not, it's not going to be pretty uh, for me. Um, so that's, that's, we're at a couple weeks. And then we're going to start, uh, I think I, I told you this a couple weeks ago, we're going to start a new sermon series called Go Team Jesus, okay? Hashtag Go Team Jesus. So we're going to be, we're going to, I'm going to encourage you guys, I'll do it with Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. We're going to be doing some cool things. Uh, with that, hashtag Go Team Jesus, figuring out all the different ways in life that we want to be on Jesus' team, and what that means in work, in family, in uh, neighborly relationships, all that kind of stuff. We want to see where we are at. Are we on God's team in Jesus, or are we on a different team that we don't really want to be on, but sometimes we find ourselves helping that team, and we don't even realize it. So we're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. Uh, today, like I said, faithfulness. Faithfulness is big. Faithfulness is something that, 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 that we have in spite of what's happening in our life. We need to keep our faith no matter what is going on. And that's a difficult, difficult thing to do. Before I get into this, though, I want to have a say our fruit of the Spirit again, if we can list it out. If you don't know it, just kind of follow along. It's in Galatians 5.22, if you want to go there, 22 and 23. Uh, but let's, for those of us who know it, you sing along. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All right? Some of your Bibles change out uh, long-suffering or forbearance for patience. Uh, don't be scared by that. They all mean the same thing. Uh, that's in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And we believe that the fruit of the Spirit, these, those nine attributes that we find in the life of believers increase over time, right? They, we become a believer and maybe we're good at some of those things and maybe we're not so good at other ones of those, but they should be ever increasing more and more in the life of the believer as he or she moves along on their path towards following God more and more in their lives. Now, what's hard is when one goes, the rest goes. Okay? The biggest one I think that we see that in is patience. We cannot have any other attribute in the fruit of the Spirit if we are impatient. If you're impatient, you're not going to be very loving. Okay? Husbands, wives, think of how you talk to each other in the mornings when you're, if you need to get in. If one of you is not getting in the car quick enough, what's your tone of voice like towards the other? It's, if you're not patient, 
You're not any of those, you're not kind, you're not good, uh, you're not exhibiting self-control, I promise you that. Um, so with one goes, the others go. And this, this, this one we're on this week, faithfulness, so hard. I, try, I, I put out this morning, I was reading through uh, Francis Chan, one of my favorite uh, pastors out there, and he, he put out a quote just this morning uh, on his Twitter account. And, and um, I'm going to see if I remember, but it said, if you do not keep your faith in God, pretty soon you will begin to doubt God. And if you're doubting God, you're not going to be following Him in every other area of your life that He wants to speak to you on. Amen? He's, he's, he, it's impossible. You're getting to a place where if you don't believe that God has the best for you, you are not going to follow His will for the different areas of your life. Okay? Faithfulness. It's hard. When life is getting you down, when, uh, when things are not working out the way they're supposed to work out, when it seems like everybody is against you, when it feels like everything that's happening on this earth is just smacking you right in the face, over and over again. God says that our faithfulness actually should increase because of that. That's tough. Man, that's hard. See, we operate as Christians under a, a, a misbelief, usually, that if we are following God, if we say, okay, God, I'm, 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 man, you're it. I'm following you. I'm going all the way. I'm go team Jesus. If I'm going to do that, then, then God's going to work out everything that needs to happen so that it becomes easy for me to follow Jesus. And sadly, that is not the case. And longtime Christians can attest to the fact that life does not always get easier when you follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes it gets harder. But we come up with a way to handle those problems that do come up. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. That's where we're going to be at this morning. One of my all-time favorite verses. And then we'll jump over to, well, I'll just I'll, I'll share the verse from Romans. I don't even need to go to it. But Hebrews 11, 1. Most people will attribute Hebrews to the to the uh, to be authored by Paul, but in most newer theologians, historians, and and uh, people who study this kind of stuff, they're they're leaning towards they have no idea who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, most people will attribute it to Paul, though, if they're going to attribute it to somebody. But anyways, Hebrews chapter 11. This is the faith chapter. Anyone ever heard of Hebrews chapter 11 called the faith chapter? It goes on to talk about um, you know Abraham. David and Nehemiah and all these giants of the faith. All these people that have done amazing, amazing things. And it testifies to how faithful they were in spite of all the difficulties they had. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, if you are there, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's the biblical definition of faith. Being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now my, my newer NIV version says faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And I like that word confidence, but I like saying it the way that I learned it back when I was a child. Faith is being sure. I am positive. I am confident in what I hope for. And I am certain, I believe 100% fully in what I do not see. And that is faith. And we have to take a lot of things by faith in this world, especially if we're going to be Christians. But being sure of what we hope for. How do we get to hope? How do we get to this thing that we, 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 we have a hope for something? What do we hope for? Do you have that answer in your life? What is it that you want to get out of this world that we are, we find ourselves living in right now? What is it that you are hoping for? A lot of people hope for a good job. A lot of people hope for um, 
enough money to retire on by the time they're 63 and a half years old, whatever the number is now, that Social Security says you should retire by. A lot of people hope for solid family life. A lot of people hope for uh, enough time to be able to do the fun things that they want to do in life. Uh, I know a pastor friend of mine who has got a, a bucket list of things that he wants to do, and he's got he's that type A personality kind of guy, and he's got it all sorted out into ministry goals and family goals and uh, personal fun goals. His personal fun goals, one of the things he wants to do, there's a guest, and I'm not sure, I think it's in Yellowstone. Uh, there's this rim, I don't know if they, someone can correct me on this, if they, if they know this one. There's this rim that you can walk in Yellowstone National Park. It's like, it's several miles long, and it's fairly treacherous. And he wants to walk this thing, um, and that's one of his goals. The other one he wants to do is he wants to uh, parasail. That's one of his personal fun time goals. And uh, another thing that he wants to do that, that I would absolutely love to do, and I don't know if my wife would ever let me do that, uh, is, is to actually jump out of an airplane um, and do the whole skydiving thing. Oh my goodness, I'd love to do that <coughs> so bad. I feel bad, you know, like, but you know, if you're a beginner, they make you go with somebody. I feel bad for the person that I have to wrap around. You know, you have to like double wrap. They, I wrap around them and they wrap. I feel really bad for that person uh, who has to go with me. So, um, but those are fun things that we want to do. So sometimes um, the things that we hope for, are very worldly things, right? Think, I want you to be honest with yourself. What do you hope for in this world? Now, a solid family, that's a great thing to hope for. But how are you going to achieve that goal? How are you going to make that hope a reality? Are you going to do it through worldly measures? Or are you following God so that He gives you that ability to lead your family in a way that allows you to hope for a better future. Paul says in Romans that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. That's If you just stop right there, that's a tough, tough, tough way to look at faith. The testing of your faith, the testing of my faith, will produce perseverance. Has anyone ever persevered through anything? Show of hands, if you, if you truly persevere through something, is it fun? Persevering is an awful word. It's, 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 it makes me cringe when I think if I have to persevere through something. And this, see, when we get to the self-control part, this is the thing I'm going to hate. I, I, I need to start exercising better. I need to start dieting better. And I need to persevere through the no funness of dieting and exercise. I need to persevere through that. And I hate persevering. I hate it. It's no fun at all. So the testing of our faith, though, if we're going to have faith, it is going to be tested. And if our faith is going to be tested, then we need to persevere through that test. That is no fun. That is absolutely awful in my book. But when we keep going, the testing of our faith produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. It produces something inside of us that says, you can do this. You are learning the right way to live your life. You are learning the right way to lead your family. You are learning the right way to go through troubles. You are learning the right way to actually persevere through testing of your faith. So let your faith be tested. You will persevere through that. Don't give up in the middle of that perseverance. That perseverance will produce something inside of you that is so good. That is so good that when you come out of that test, you will have hope. Paul says the testing of our faith produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. When you're making good choices, when you're following the way that God wants you to live, when that character is shining through after you've persevered through the testing of your faith, you have hope that all of that was worth it. Have you ever been there where you're going through something and you're like, man, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I don't know how much farther I can go. 
when you persevere, you find out that all of that is going to be worth it. And we have hope for a future in heaven. And we have hope for the future in heaven for our family, for our spouses, for our kids, for our grandkids, for our great, 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 great grandkids. I love the stories of family legacies. That is one of my absolute things. If I'm going to read a biography of somebody, I don't want to just read about their life. I want to read about how they became that person because of the generation before them, and the generation before them, and the generation before them that produced in them this ability to persevere through life's trials. We learn how to persevere through life's trials because of our parents and their parents. And when we learn that properly, we get to go through and we learn hope early on. I am grateful, so, so grateful for the legacy that my parents have given me because of how they persevered through the testing of their faith. Now, my dad had to start. He had to be the start of that. There was no persevering through anything in the generation before my dad. And I know a lot of you are probably in that situation right now. That there was nothing before you or nothing before your parents that gave you the ability to fight, to have hope, to remain faithful in the midst of the hard times of life. But because he was willing to do that, he set the course for generations to follow after him that would remain faithful to God. Because he found out that when he persevered through the testing of his faith that he became a Christian, that good character that grows out of him. And because of that character, he has a hope for a better future. And he implanted that in me. And I will be forever grateful for that. So if that's where you're at today, if you need to be the start of a family legacy that says, I am going to have a hope for a future, and I want that same hope for my kids, I better teach them how to persevere through life's trials. I better teach them how to build up character in them because they have persevered. And when they have that good character, they can have the same hope that I have in a future in heaven. And that's a great family legacy. And we talked about this so word about that. We talked about the, 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 the um, success that comes when we follow the Word of God. And success is so much more than money or job or career or anything like that. It's about what kind of family legacy we can leave. And that's an awesome thing. The other time that's hard to have faithfulness is when life's going good. Amen? Anybody ever been there? Life's going really good. You can't, hey, man, I got, I got the raise I wanted. Uh, everything came out perfectly with uh, the medical stuff going on and nothing, nothing was wrong, everything's perfect. Uh, my kids, straight A students, everything is going, woo, easy. And sometimes we give ourselves so much credit for the good things that are going on in our lives. So man, I'm, I'm looking for a shot. You know, I get that, get that mirror out, put myself up and down, yeah. Things good. And all of a sudden, something comes up and it shatters that mirror. Just it's like a rock is just flung at that thing. In your entire world, you think that, that mirror that you're looking at, man, life is good, everything's going exactly the way I want it to go, man, woo! And a rock hits that thing. A problem hits that thing. Something fills with sadness. It's that thing. It's that mirror. And your world, you think that that's your world, and it shatters into a million pieces. Because you're so focused on an illusion of reality and giving yourself all the credit in the world. And God is the giver of all good things. When we allow ourselves to get off course of having our faith in God and we start putting all of our faith in ourselves and saying, man, I'm making all the right decisions, I'm doing all the right things, I'm, I'm disciplined, I'm, 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 I'm following what I know I'm supposed to follow, this is what my grandma told me to do, and when I became an adult, man, I'm doing it. And we stop asking God the direction He wants us to go. We get into this illusionary life and something is going to shatter 
that mirror. And where's our faith at that point? Do we have the ability to then allow our faith to be tested so that we can then persevere, to have good character, and to have faith <coughs> come out of a bad situation? Life is full of adversity. If you are not going through any adversity, watch out. It's coming. Okay? Absolutely every person goes through something. Where is your faith at right now? Are you ready to have your faith tested? Are you ready to persevere through the test that's going to come? And have you persevered enough before that you've got some good character inside of you already? Or do you need to learn some of that good character through the persevering of a new test? That's what faith is all about. Saying, good times, bad times, hell or high water, I have faith in God. That He is going to do for me what I need Him to do. And I'm going to follow Him regardless of how things are going on in my life. I am absolutely going to take one step in front of the other, and I'm going to follow His will. And I'm going to remain faithful, even when my faith is tested. And that's hard. When our faith is tested in other people, when we put our faith in people, and that faith is tested, the mirrors are crushed, and people let us down, we lose faith in that person. When we put our faith in God, and we continue to allow Him to reveal more and more things about us, and we follow Him regardless of good times or bad times, our faith, will when we persevere, our faith will be tested, we will persevere, character becomes hope. And we keep a hold of that hope, whether good times or bad, that we will end up in heaven. I shared with the Sunday School class this morning one of my favorite, favorite topics to talk about. Favorite Bible stories is the disciples on the boat. Uh, the storm's going on, the wind and the waves, the boat's rocking, everything's going nuts. And Jesus... He's asleep in the bottom of the boat, right? He doesn't care that the storm going on. He's asleep. He doesn't care. The disciples are afraid for their life. And literally, this is a life and death moment for them. They are scared that their life is going to end. And so they wake Jesus up because they know that he can save them. First words out of his mouth. Why are you afraid? Why? Faith is being sure of what we hope for, <coughs> certain of what we do not see. I don't hear any fear in that verse. I don't hear anything that, that talks about worrying about what's going on in this world. I hear surety. I hear certainty. Confidence in the fact that God is going to get us through and my favorite quote ever, John Piper, if you know him, he's a, he's a pastor of Minnesota. He, he, a sermon I heard of his one time said, Jesus didn't ask why are you afraid to the disciples because of the storm that could kill them. He asked them, why are you afraid? Because even in drowning, there's nothing to fear. As Christians, we have absolutely nothing to fear if we are following Jesus Christ. Because when we are afraid of losing our life on this earth, we are storing up treasures on earth. But if we are willing to say that I have nothing to fear on this earth, I am storing up my treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, that's where I'm going. And so if something's going to come and, and take me away right now, no. great. <laughs> great. I will go to heaven gladly right now. I don't have anything to fear. Paul says in one of his writings that I would rather go to heaven and spend more time on this earth. But God has not called me up there yet. And so I am going to give all of my life to the ministry that he has placed before me. And that is our, what our response should be as well. We don't have to fear leaving this earth. While we are here, we give everything we can the ministry that God has placed in front of us. Whether it's 
as a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or as a, uh, a mom or a dad, a grandparent, you have a, as a neighbor, you have a ministry that God has placed in front of you. Give to that ministry everything that you have. Live your life as a testament to the fact that you have persevered through faith in faith, through the storms of life, through the trials of life. And you have good character, and that good character produces hope that this world is not the end. This world is not the end. I wish I had the, the song, this world is not, I'm not home yet. This world is not where I belong. This right here, this earth, this is where God has placed me for a time. So I can drag as many people as possible into heaven with me. That's what I want to do. I want to live my life in such a way that people look at me and say, man, that guy's got some faith in something that I don't understand how he has it. Because they can't see it. They've never experienced it. And we, having experienced the fact that God has done something in our life, we can have faith and be sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see because we have experienced the power of God in our lives. If you have experienced God in your life, you can be 100% confident that He is real and that He is calling you to follow Him. And no matter what storm rears its head at you in this world, on this earth, you are going to rejoice someday in heaven because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces. Do you have hope this morning? Do you have hope that God is going to come through for you in the end? That no matter what, that you are going to follow God, you are going to put one foot in front of the other walk along the path that says I love Jesus. You can have that hope this morning. You can have that hope for the rest of your life. But you've got to surrender whatever it is in your life that is in the way. And that's why I love that song. I surrender all. Worldly pleasures, all forsaken. Take me Jesus. Take me now. That's all I want to say to him is that I love him so much that no matter what path he has for me, I am going to follow him. And that's my testimony. It can be your testimony today as well. We're going to take uh, communion this morning as we have every fruit, every sermon out of the of the Spirit's sermon series. Communion is an awesome time. Communion is, 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 comes from the word community. We do this together. This is not a one-on-one a, a -on -one thing. This is not a... Communion is not something you do in your home by yourself. Communion is something that you do with the body of believers that, who are coming together to say, we are following God together. It's a huge, huge testament to what we want to accomplish as a, as a body of believers. Communion is for those people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay? If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do that today, and you can take it in. It's an awesome thing. I, one of my favorite, favorite moments in a church service. I was in a, a church service at a college church in America, and there was 4,000 teenagers there. Right? And we, we were going to take communion with 4,000 people. And I got to be one of the, the guys that served at the altar, and I held the, the, the basket of bread, and they came, and they grabbed a basket and dipped the, the, the grape juice next to it, and they take their communion. It's one thing that's come down the aisle. I know there, there's thousands of people. There's like four or five aisles, thousands of kids coming down. And I can see, I mean, 20, 30 kids back, bawling his eyes out, absolutely bawling his eyes out as he's coming forward. Gets closer, I actually see, I recognize him. I know who he is. He's a pastor's kid. This is back in the early 2000s. Pastor's kids walking down towards me. So I'm, I don't know what he's coming about. His girlfriend just break up with him or something? I don't know what's going on. And he gets down to me. And this is like a quick moving thing. You're not supposed to stop and, and chit chat and talk. And he says, I can't take you. And so I, I said, well, what, what are you doing here then? He's like, I need to pray. 
about what God is speaking to me about. And we went and we talked. We gave the basket to somebody else, and we prayed at an altar. And by the time the rest of the kids had come through and taken communion, he had rededicated his life to Christ and said, I can take communion now. It was maybe the, the most impactful moment in my life to see a 16-year-old kid recognize the fact that he was not right with God. He wanted to be very right with God. And he stepped aside and he said, i got to do this first. I have to confess my sins. Ask Jesus to forgive me again. And then I can take you. And you know what, guys? It doesn't matter how many times you need to ask for forgiveness. It doesn't matter how many times you need to confess sin. God is going to be there every single time. And He's going to say, yes, my child, you are forgiven. If that's you today, I would encourage you to, to come to an altar. I would encourage you to sit in your pew until you are ready to take me come and be a part of that. If you are not ready to take communion, you do not need to do that today and you do not need to feel guilty about that today. I would encourage you, though, to come and talk to me. If you are unsure about whether or not to take communion, talk to me. And we will go through it and we will have a great time doing it because God is all about grace and mercy and forgiveness. And He is about joining together as a body of believers and having a community of believers take communion together. And it is so awesome. Bill, do you have some music that you can play? I'm going to pray. And we're going to do this. I'm just going to pull the cover off. And when you are ready to come, take communion, come and take it. If you need to kneel at an altar and pray, please do that. If there's someone out there that can pray with you, drag them up with you. If you need to come, get me to pray with you. By all means, come and do that. But be joined within the body of believers today. And be hopeful that you have a future in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you, we praise you. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you that his shed blood was broken and spilled for us. And that his body was beaten and bruised so that we can have life. And we can participate in communion. Communion with each other and communion with you. And we thank you for that opportunity. Would you be with everyone that's in here today? Would you speak to hearts? Would you convict hearts that need to ask for forgiveness, Lord God? And would you give them the hope that if they can give that up to you, if they can surrender everything to you, that they can have hope for a future that is better than anything that this earth has to offer. Lord God, we love you. We praise you in your name. We pray. Amen. Go ahead and start that music, Bill. And whenever you are ready, please come.